Thank you, John. It is such an honor to be here in this, in this museum. Of course, much of my experience with Walter and Leo was up at the, up at the palace. But all of the people who were, who were honored this morning, who were a part of converting the, the beauty and the works and the availability of Walter and Leo to the rest of the world, I, I give you such immense credit. This museum is just absolutely terrific. So thank you very much, and thank you for the honor of being here with you. I have a neighbor who has kind of a wry sense of humor. And of course, a couple of days ago, he says, now, when you go down there to that audience, he says, start with a couple of jokes. You know, get them warmed up. Start with a couple of jokes. And because one of my lifelong dearest friends, Pat Flaher, refolded less than a week ago, I'm not really in the mood to start with a joke. And so I decided to start with what I call the, you know, begin where you want the end to go. And I'm going to read you a little bit, just a little bit, of the, of the uh, obituary of, of Pat Flaher. And this is the human being that if all human beings on earth, as we all know so many, were like this, this man who was a brother and, he, and his wife is a sister to all of us who've been with Walter and Leo in the palace for so long. Patrick Flaher, Patrick Wayne Flaher of Cabins, West Virginia, after 72 years and 362 days of absorbing all the information and human experience life has to offer, retired to his home in the stars. <laughs> On Tuesday, September 13th, 2022, Pat answered the call to return to the stardust from whence he came. Choosing to reincarnate in his next plane of existence as a complicated math problem, we know about that, <laughs> that when solved is a decodable anagram for a charmingly witty dad joke. Pat had this gentle, charismatic way of letting you know from the bottom of his heart, that he accepted you exactly as you are. Pat was a true explorer of the world, an astronomer, a train conductor, a go-kart racer, a backpacker, a spelunker, and like Jesus, he was unfailingly kind and selfless and had a knack for, constru for construction. That was Pat Flaher, and part of my way of beginning with the end in mind. The other part of my way of beginning with the end in mind, Darren, is I'm going to show you a short video that's going to leap way ahead of all that I'm going to bring to you in the next hour. And it's going to show you the end and what can, is possible with the Age of Character Clubs once it's out there in the world and translated into the language of every person. Do you want to do the video first, Darren? This is the, the end. We are beginning with the end in mind. Hey guys, welcome to Kids Talk. I'm your host, Kaylin Stotler, and today I'm here with Grace Weber. Talk. I'm your host, Candace, and this is my guest, JC. Talk. My name is Michaela Snow, I'm the host, and this is Michaela O'Ryan. She's the guest, and today is our theme is positive attitude. How do you think you could have a positive attitude in your community? Well, it, there's always going to be negatives that come your way, and just finding the positive within the negative, it's always possible. And it's just always a positive thing to find the positive in the negative. How does it affect school with a positive attitude? Well, if you're like really down and negative, then if other people see you when you're acting negative, then they could act also negative and become negative. Does it affect your schoolwork when you're negative? Um, sometimes. Does it affect your peers when you're negative? Um, maybe not my peers, because usually people compliment me on my positivity, <laughs> but um, I've seen other people who get very angry for random reasons, and other people around me get really angry. What positive attitudes do you see in the community? Like, there are a lot of positive attitudes in the community. Like, when you, like, some teachers, like, if you look at a teacher, 
like, or you communicate with them, they're more peppy and like happier. Cause it kind of reflects like if a teacher is happy and peppy, it kind of reflects on their students and it helps them learn better. And then in like stores and clerks and stuff and management and all that. What are some healthy stress relievers that you could tell people to do? Um, doing what you love, what you enjoy. It's always, you, you're always happy when you do things that you love. Being around friends or yeah. uh, have you have any good stories? Um, I read in my book, I like to read, um, that there was um, a bomber going onto an airplane mm -hmm. and he didn't like anybody. And there was this one guy who was like, hi, um, I hope you have a good day. You look like you really need it. So um, I have this piece of chocolate bar if you want it, you know. And he always smiled. He's like, well, have a safe and good trip. And he went up and sat in his seat. And the bomber decided not to blow up the plane because he met a happy person. So, and a when you talk to your friends, when you have a negative attitude, does it make you feel better? It does. So Just letting it out is always, always a good thing. So, and when tells the time when you were positive, but other people were negative too. Um, sometimes, I'll, like some of my friends are always negative, so mm -hmm. I have to like compromise. Some like not all of it, but. And I'll be positive sometimes, and they'll be, why are you so happy? Why are you so positive? Why? And they'll, you know, use foul language at me while I'm positive, but I just ignore it and still try to be happy. Because if you keep being happy, then they might, you know, become happy or become positive. So how does, like, the people, your peers, how does it, like, if your peers are negative, how does it affect you? Or if they're positive, how does it affect you? Well, it doesn't really affect me because I'm more staying to myself. But like, it can affect more people in a different way because like, if a lot of their peers are negative, they're going to be more negative. And if they're positive, they're going to turn more positive. So that's beginning with the end in mind. I think as much as harmonic balance interchange, you'll find interspersed in all the Russell books, both by Leo and by Walter, the idea of awakening love and light globally around the globe. What you've just seen in that film, if, if that isn't awakening love and light in young people, and you don't think that's what that is, I don't think Walter and Leah would agree with you. And that's what the future of the character clubs is out in the world as it's being done under this model. As you all walked in, you received a copy of the book I wrote 20 years ago. Um, and you can all start working on it. This month, September, is Do Your Best. And the color for September is Word Gold. And I have a lifelong friends of the university toward the back, uh, Sam and Martha Spiker, and they know that September is do your best at award gold. And if you can see them sitting back there, you can see they're both wearing award gold, which is what we all do. This is how we remind ourselves of what the monthly habit is. So moving the age of character clubs into the future. That's what this is all about today. Next one. The Russell's warning goes as far back as the Iliad, that unless, unless we awaken ourselves to the need for light and love, then we are, need to be awakened from the self-imposed mediocrity. And the civilization will fall again into yet another age of darkness. And we all are feeling much of that around us now. And he knew it a long time ago. This is, again, stepping back out into the regular civilization. No, th this man, you know, this man, Rodney King, he didn't have even a high school education. But his words, why can't we all get along? It's so simple. It's, that's the issue. That's the problem. Not eloquent, not educated, but 
as every bit as meaningful as Walter and, Re and, Walter and Leo. Okay. Next. So in the 100 years since Walter wrote The Universal One, and in the 56 years since the International Age of Character Clubs was formed, fear has grown more than love. And I think we know that. Violence has reached, you can read that for yourself. This is Henry Giraud is an op-ed writer who I'm very fond of. Um, this is as of the 1st of September. This is his observation of the status of the world today. Lael Russell's book on love. It's one of the most profound writings on how to get along in a relationship, what love is all about. And like our speaker yesterday, Robert Grant, in her book on love, she, she tells us all about the corn, the people, the corn. Today, you're going to learn about growing the corn. Not only are you going to learn about growing the corn, but you're going to walk out here being a part of growing the corn. You saw this slide yesterday in uh, Ariston's presentation. And this was their message of knowledge and education. I think it's the best. I don't know if there are sheets that other people in the audience can see around the university or in, here in the museum. But I think it's the most succinct summary of everything that Walter and Leo intended to convey globally. If you can summarize wall-to-wall -wall books that they wrote into one sheet, I think that's it. And Ariston obviously agrees with me. But I've lifted a few points out around which the program for taking the character clubs into the future is, is, is fixed, is made to happen. I'm going to tell you for a minute, let me just take a brief administrative point and tell you that I have something called myasthenia gravis, which is in the, uh, which is the Parkinson's category. So sometimes my face doesn't work right. Um, Words don't quite come, so please don't let that interfere with. That's why I put a lot of what I have to say to you in writing on the screen. Um, but don't let that put you off. Uh, I certainly would never compare my, my IQ with Robert's from yesterday. But <laughs> and he, he did teach us all about corn. But today, we, we know that the world needs us to grow that corn. And that's what I'm here to do. So. Please, you know, if, if I stutter a little, um, please bear with me. So next slide. So here are the excerpts from, these are the, F, so these are the excerpts from their old work upon which everything that I've been doing for the last 30 years is built. That the inherent goodness of all people, that rhythmic balanced interchange in human relations is possible. Not only is it possible, but it's residing right this minute as we sit here in every human being on earth. Love ye one another, the golden rule. We need the invisible qualities of truth, honesty, loyalty, and kindness in our daily interchanges in order to bring the spirit of joy into every life. Notice that I interjected in red the practice of. If we're not practicing it, then how do we get the corn from here to here? So in, I took the liberty of interjecting just that simple word, practice. We need to begin to practice the awakening of love and light in the world. In his book, God Will Work, in her book, God Will Work, Worth work with you, not for you. She says, let us transform the world by renewing of the world mind. That transformation can take place only by our acquiring knowledge of our inseparable and eternal moment to moment unity with a comprehensible creator. She says, let's transform the world. And down toward the end, she says again, moment to moment, and I put in the now with a comprehensible creator and of our unity with all people and, of course, with all of nature. 
I'm revealing this sentence to you, probably for the first time in a public viewing. But for at least 50 of my 80 years here on Earth, I've been wondering what is. And long before I came in touch with the Russells, I studied everything, all the, all the religions of the world, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so I began years and years ago writing a sentence, what is God? And as I grew and I learned through this period, I would go back to this one sentence, which in my computer is called it, and re-update re and refine my definition of what God is. And in listening to the, all of the talks, in listening to Richard yesterday or Robert yesterday, I see nothing in this statement that is at, at odds with anything that's been said, with any of the mathematics, that God is the great d divine intention. And God isn't somewhere else. That great divine intention is in you and you and you. It's in all of us right now. It's great and it's divine and it, it's intention. It's not chaos. It's on purpose. And, and that intention is spiraling love and light energy. And that love and light energy is resonating. Harmony. It's asking us to be in harmony, like the birds, like the trees, like the flowers, like everything in nature, like the universes. This great intention is, is asking harmony of us and it's resonating within each of us and within all of us right now. So therefore, God is the great divine intention. Next. So the collective potential for sacred societal order then for a balanced, healthy planet is dynamically resonating within each of us and within all of us right now. We can learn everything that the Russells wrote. We could listen to every speaker that we now or we will listen to in the future. But unless we act on and practice that divine love that's resonating in us right this minute, and I'm going to go on to explain how we could do it a little more organized way than we used to, uh, then that great awakening that Leo and Russell wanted isn't going to happen. So, Harmonic balance interchange is their format for awakening love and light. Therefore, this is the International Age of Characters, and this is right off the website. Their sole purpose, when Leo founded it in about 1966, is to give people of every race, rat, nationality, and creed in every walk of life an opportunity to share the greatest joy on earth, interchange with loving understanding, something that those of us in the Russell family and the university family, we know well, okay? We need to wake the invisible qualities of truth, honesty, loyalty, and kindness in our daily interchanges. And again, I've added both to be known and practiced. That's the key word, okay? Recognition and knowledge, which we have here, are easy compared to practice. The mind requires, this is from a post that I found on the Character Club site in, in June of 2017. The mind requires close observation and we need to be continuously making consciously harmonious choices, moment to moment, to move us forward into the experience of our oneness, okay? The next step to bring love, oh, this is a, a interesting piece. This is an excerpt. It must have been an introduction that Walter made about Leo at some point in time when she was speaking and he was introducing her. But what I like about this is that Walter says, the next step to bringing love, romance, peace, and happiness to this unhappy, fearing world will be initiated by women. Yay. <laughs> Walter said that. They will be aided by the most liberal of intellectual men to bring a balanced civilization into being which will endure forever. Walter said that. 
He said that about his wife, Leo, and he said that about all women. Okay. This is October 1982. Probably, it was around September because I wrote to her in October. And I was first introduced to Leo by Michael Hudak, a, a, a former president of the university. And we spent the day conversing about her age of character clubs. And when she found out that I had a master's degree in marketing, and she knew that we would, we would need to be moving into that field in order to be able to spread the love and the light around the globe, she issued me a challenge and asked me to carry on her age of character clubs. I also met Melford O'Kilo and had tea with he and Leo in their, in their dining room that day. That's not when I got the pin. I'll tell you about that later. OK? At that point, I was vice president of marketing for a $135 million company that actually was a beauty supply company. <laughs> My friends used to say, Elaine, what's an altruist like you doing selling hairspray? <laughs> Well, Leo didn't think an altruist like me should be selling hairspray either. So she invited me. She knew that it would only grow through moving into the media that I knew how to manage and asked me, issued me the challenge to help her spread the message. OK? This, how many of you have been to, been to the palace? OK, this is the water tower, and it's, if you're walking toward the gardens in the back and to the, if you move, there's a path to the right of the portico with the old water tower. When I was there in 1982, let's see, this tree right here was about this high, okay? And it was in between meetings with her, and I had this huge enlightenment. I was struck with the idea that. Mankind needed to find harmony and balance in our interchanges before the tree got taller than the tower. Or we were going to start to be in real trouble here on this earth. I took this photo in 2017. I haven't been out there yet, but I plan to be there later today. But as you can see, the truth of that that insight that came to me that day that I had spent with Leo about that tree and that tower is already upon us. Okay? This is a poem that you kind of have to read it because there's a lot of meaning in the uppercase, the lowercase, the interchanging of the I with the I. Um, so I'll see to it that anybody who wants this poem, but I wrote this poem later because when Leo challenged me, I was afraid. I didn't, I, didn't know, I didn't know what I would do. I didn't have a market plan at that point. And so it scared me to think of taking on the challenge that she gave me. And that's why, along with a letter I wrote to her a month or so later, I, I wrote her that poem. Does anybody, are you reading it now, or shall I go on to the next slide? Shall I go on? Then, five years to the day later, I too had a huge awakening, a, a much bigger than the tree awakening in the, in the garden. I was awakened in the middle of the night. You know, Elaine, you go off and volunteer. And yes, you help a child, and you help this child, and you teach a class. But you go back to your office at your big corporation, and with a staff of 12, you, you influence the buying decisions of millions of people. And, he, and, and, and the universe said to me that a year is a spiral in space and time. And that like astrology, humanity can be inspired through focusing our passage through each of the months to both resonate and practice one aspect of coherent, unifying monthly principles of awakened love. Each month would align with one of 12 good character aspects of harmoniously loving and patient, balanced human interchanges. Actually, in marketing language, that's called branding. 
In other words, what, what the universe asked me to do was to make each month of the year a brand name for one of 12 aspects of harmonious living and to give human beings on Earth a chance to kind of organize our coherent focus on, on just one of these 12 aspects for a 30-day period of each month of the year, OK? Well, after that awakening or that enlightenment in, in 1987, I, well then I, was, I had changed jobs and I was at Wintergreen and I was on my way back home and I had kind of gotten away from the Russells and the palace. I didn't know what was going on. My sons left for college and on this cold drizzly day in May, I decided to go to the palace. And it was dark and cold and drizzly and I was standing facing the big door, and those who have been there, you know that door, knocking to see if someone would let me in. And finally, a volunteer opened the door, and I do not know who it was, but a volunteer opened the door, and instead of greeting me, her eyes lifted, and she said, Leo. That Luna moth was on the pillar of the palace. It was at least eight inches in diameter. And it was on the pillar of the palace outside the front door right behind where I was standing. And I had not seen it until she called my attention to it. And those of us who know Leo, those of us, her flowing, this is her pin, which I didn't get till years later. Um, anyway, that was the second time I met Leo. But that moment, I knew that I couldn't go any longer without acting on the, the enlightenment that I had, OK? This is a poem by Leo about the symbolic passage from, you know, from caterpillar to butterfly through the chrysalis. And here at, Walt, at the university and in the works of Walter and Russell, there's, we're in this beautiful chrysalis. And some of it, a few butterflies, some butterflies have flown out there in ways that actually inspire perhaps the young people that you saw at the very beginning to be acting in harmoniously inspired love and light, but not enough. So we're still looking for the butterfly to have a much broader wings and to go much further. And I'm going to tell you why, OK? That it's a daunting challenge to achieve Leo's vision. And she knew it, and I knew it. And everyone sitting in this room, would you say it's a daunting challenge? Do we need, the, the, do we need many more than us in this room? Do we need many more than we can possibly reach in any way other than electronic media? We absolutely do, OK? The need is not to find a new message. We know the message but to find the most powerful messenger of change. And the most powerful messenger of change on the planet, we all know, is the media. And we need that change to be both parallel harmony between spirit and the physical plane. It, it can be a change of spirit, but it also needs to be practiced on the physical plane. You can be a meditator who gets up every morning and communes with God. But on your way to work, if you cut in front of somebody on the highway, is that harmony? Is that person in harmony? Absolutely not. OK? So here are some the strategies that we know of for unifying global coherence. Prayer. There are studies about prayer. And I'm, I'm going to run through this quickly because I have more slides on each one of these. Prayer, meditation, there's a famous, oh, I'm going to show you that in a minute. There's a famous experiment done in 1993 in Washington by the Transcendental Meditators, of which I am one, that will show you the power of coherence spreading among a population. Social media, we all know that. And then the last is where I was pr previously employed, corporate media. 
organized mass media campaigns. Mostly they're to sell consumer goods and politicians, but there have been good ones. Give a hoot, don't pollute. You know, prevent forest fires, just say no. Mass media has been used in the past for good and it can continue to be used for good, okay? So prayer. In 2000, they, they, there was a study showing that of, let's see, in 23 studies, 13 studies showed significant positive results in a patient's behavior because they had large bodies of people praying for them. Nine studies showed no effect and one study had a negative effect. So there is a lot of evidence of that coherence power of prayer out there, causing effects on people who don't know what we know, who don't have the advantage of being here, who are out there, but who we can connect to and, and be coherent with because we're sending out those signals. Prayer, next. This is meditation, and this is the study in, in DC. So it was the summer of 1993, and I'd become a meditator in 91. And so Northeast United States, we were all asked to be part of this. So they went to the leaders in Washington, DC, and they said they were gonna send 2,000 siddhas, you know what a siddha is? It's kind of an advanced meditator, into the city of DC for the entire month of, of, of August, when crime, of course, is rampant in, in D.C. in August, and that they were telling the leaders of D.C. that they were going to bring crime down in D.C. 20% in a month by coherently meditating and resonating throughout the, throughout the community. The police chief said to the emissary from the Transcendental Group, the only thing that's going to bring crime down 20% in D.C. in August is 20 inches of snow, ma'am. <laughs> but they not only did those meditators go into the city and they were interspersed in hotels and apartments and rooms throughout DC and they were focusing their meditation on peace, nonviolence, as were all of us living in that area. I mean, I participated in that study alone in my own bedroom in my own meditation. And down here it says the, the likelihood that that, of, that that is a not an anomaly or just an anomaly is like 0.0, this is, this is Robert, Robert Grant stuff, but it's, it's less than in one, two in one billion point zero 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 two, meaning the likelihood that, that the coherence resonating out from the meditators in the city wasn't really why the crime went down are very, very small. It's a fabulous study, okay. Next, the heart math. How many of you are aware of heart math? Heart math is very involved and in leading a international study of global coherence. It's a contemporary experiment where they're examining the interconnection between the human energy field, collective human emotions, which we've been discussing, and the planetary energy field. And they, this is one of their detectors, and Robert gave it its proper name yesterday. To me, it was one of, it's one of the detectors. It's some kind of a, I saw the diagram, and any of you can go on HeartMath and find out more about this, but that's what it looks like. And this is where they have them around the world right now, okay? Okay, next. In a talk by Greg, Bred, Greg Braden, uh, in his talk on global global crisis, he showed this graph that I screen clicked it, so please give Greg Braden the credit for this, although I think it probably goes to heart math. But this is showing the ups and downs of the, of the, res, of the resonating. And this shows that this point right here, which is the highest point of common global resonance ever measured, was shortly after nine in the morning on September 11th, 2001, when the whole world was brought into harmonic residence. Okay. Third, social media currently favors the practice of fear and violence. 
You can read this slide, but you don't need to. We all know that. Okay? And it's become normalized. I mean, it's just so normalized. The division, the hate, it's all normalized. So don't bother reading this slide. Let's go to the next one. This is from the Russell Holmes study course. The unfolding of man to a higher level because of the balanced giving by the few is resisted by the downward drag of unbalanced taking of the many. And this is what we're feeling in the world today. And the Russells knew it. It's right there in their home study course. Okay. So this brings me to an old Cherokee trail. And those of you that asked me about the doggy I was with in my photograph, that's not a doggy, that's a wolf. His name is Logan, and he was brought to one of my schools in March, which if you look at your book, is Resolve Conflicts, where the children were taught that wolf packs do a better job of harmoniously caring about one another in their packs than we do as humans. But this old Cherokee parable is a story of a grandfather talking to his grandson about the two, two wolves inside of us that are fighting to dominate us, the wolf of love and the wolf of fear. And as he's talking, the, grand, the grandson kind of interrupts the grandfather and says, but grandpa, which wolf wins? And the grandfather says, the wolf you feed. How many of you know that? I'm not surprised. So that is the issue on the planet today. We here in this room, we here at this fabulous university, we who know the truths of Walter and Leo, we, we're not using the powerful tools that those of us who are feeding the wolf of fear are using to reach the population. Organized mass media messaging campaigns. It is without parallel the kingpin in what is producing knowledge, identities, agency values, and social relations. Again, one of my favorite op-ed guys. <laughs> but I think it's very well put. Media is the kingpin. And unless we start using it, we are, you know, unless we break some of this down into sound bites that everybody can understand and do, we're not going to get from point A to point B, as Leo knew back in 1982. Okay. So, secular media is impersonating the influence of one consciousness. Can you all see that that's happening? It's basically moving into the minds and hearts of people who don't know what we do and impersonating itself as being the consciousness they should be drawn to instead of the consciousness that we know is the one true consciousness that's going to change the planet. So we've been drawn for fear and consumerism, basically. And I'm going to show you a little more about that. Coca-Cola the company is a little older than the works of Walter and Leo, has 320 million consumers in North America alone. They use an organized media plan, consistent, coherent, to get into our minds. So, so 320 million people by a sweet, sticky, brown liquid that isn't nutritious, that does nothing for you. Because these people know how to motivate what people are thinking, what people are doing, and we are not doing as good a job of that as we can. OK, next. Psychology Today, this is a May 2019 article on how behavior spreads. <clears throat> and it talks about the tipping point. There's also a book called The Tipping Point by Nel Mel 
uh, Gladwell? Who knows the author? Malcolm, Any, anybody? Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell, right. Thank you so much. Um, so in order to achieve the, the life dreams of Leo and Walter, and that of all of us in this room, and, that, and those of us who love their work, we've got to reach the tipping point. As of last week, the Facebook members of the International Age of Character Clubs is 1,300. That's the last I saw. The, uh, the last time I picked up the number was in 2017. There were about 800 members. So we've picked up about 500 members since 2017 on the Facebook website for character clubs. The Russells and the U University of Science and Philosophy outreach, I was talking about this um, the, other day, the other day with you, wasn't I, Did, about how, how, how much outreach, how many people has the Russells work really, really reached? And we agreed that it was probably, I mean, go, going back all the way to the 20s, right? Wouldn't you say, maybe, it might be in the millions, the number of people have been touched by the work. However, the tipping point for the number of people we need to reach in the United States is 82.5 million. Now, in Coca-Cola terms, that's peanuts, right? But in our terms, that's a lot. And the tipping point to reach global awakening is 1.5 billion. So we got a big job ahead. And every, this is, this is going to involve all of us. Keep going. Go. Next. Martin Luther King said, those who love peace must learn to organize as effectively as those who love war. And what you have in front of you and what you're hearing from me today is how to organize peace and the awakening of love and light. Okay? So central to feeding the good wolf in the fight against fear is the need for a revitalized, organized, and sustainable strategy. When I was back in corporate America, I never did anything without a market plan or without a strategy, okay? To engage the available power of media for good, to reach and influence humankind. Why? To finally awaken and strengthen the awakening of love and life in all of us, as Leo and Walter so richly desired. This is called the Simmelweis reflex. So we suffer from collective myopia. And I, there's a little bit of it here. You know, I mean, this is so, the Russell works and their words and, and what we have here in this, it's all so beautiful. And so it, it, we, we want to hold on to it. But this is what is. And Leo knew that she, we needed to go for what could be from what they had built. So there's a tendency to reject new evidence or new approaches to solutions because it contradicts established norms. And that's just the way society works. So when a theory doesn't match the facts, they simply ignore the facts. OK, next. So Walter Russell was a troublemaker. He, he was a challenger. And I'm sitting here in front of you as a challenger. He, and three different, you know, this is just three examples of how he had challenged the status quo. I mean, we know that he predicted the last five elements of the atomic tables and was left out of the lectures where he tried to, I mean, all the things that Walter tried to share with the world, he was laughed at at the time. But he was a fighter and he went against the status quo. And that's what I'm here to share with you about now. We've learned all about the corn, and now we got to grow that corn. I picked that up from uh, Arison yesterday, or last night at dinner. She said that's, she made that comment. So thank you, Arison, for that great comment. I don't know if she's here today. OK, next. So now it's, ter it's, now it's our turn to challenge the status quo. They would want us to shift towards refocusing the power of harmonic balance interchange to heal humane relations. By, way, by the way, this is my dream. My personal dream 
is that we will no, no longer spell human H-U-M-A-N. Let's spell human. Let's spell human together. H-U-M-A-N-E. That's the goal. We want to go from human relations to humane relations. And it can be done. Coca-Cola proved it. So, with an or, so now we must access mass global media message, not then available to Walter and Leo. Again, when Leo met me, she knew that I knew that. She knew that I had access to that. And at the time, there was no internet. We didn't have access to influencing people in the ways that we do now. Okay? This is from the Divine Iliad. And this is really the key. You'll see this slide again, and it's the key underlying everything I've done. Recognition of the spiritual man sufficient to enforce its practice is the evidence of the beginning of man's unfolding of his cosmic state. But the key, the key word right there, sufficient to enforce its practice. Are we there sufficiently yet? Not yet. OK. So these are properties of the cubic wave. The spiritual metaphysical realm is the cause of the physical realm. We all know that. Within which we witness and in which we exist. OK. It was Richard I was talking to about the number of people that Walter and Leo have influenced so far. OK? So here, we, we saw this yesterday in, in Robert's work. So ours is an electric universe of spiraling motion, not a notated. The objectivity is only one single moment in the life of an entire cycle. That cycle is comprised of many such moments, some of which are, dense, are den sensed as density and materialistic, while others are beyond sensing. So we live in an electric universe, and we need to make use of it for the purposes that Walter and Leo laid out for us and for the path ahead. Next. So I, I'm not an artist like Robert, but this is kind of how I'm going to kind of explain how his cosmogony morphs into the humane relations. So we're, we exist on the sea of secular awareness. I got the, where's, the, anybody see the, there it is, okay. This little dot is too small for me. So here we are, we exist on this, on the sea of secular awareness. And every once in a while, because the convergences are random. So every once in a while, there's a random point of convergence of light and love with a being that can practice it, like Pat Flaher, the man that I read the obituary of earlier. But because it's random, it just happens every once in a while. So in moving toward one consciousness, you know, a few moments of convergence just sort of randomly get down into one consciousness but not enough to make the, global, the difference in the global change, as Walter and Leo asked us to. So forgive my artwork, but that's as good as it gets with me. <laughs> OK, next. So this, you remember how Robert talked about the circle, OK? And, the, and how my vision was the year is a spiraling circle. And Robert, again, talked yesterday about, you know, we're, we're nowhere near where we were. You know, the globaling circle of the year that we're living in right now, we're in September, but this September, today, the, the 18th of September instead of the 17th, it, we're, 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 we've spiraled in the universe. So what I'm showing is that when we spiral consciousness of one, you know, of the golden year, one month at a time, so we're spiraling on one topic at a time, moving in to one consciousness. We, we're able to have focus, and we're able to 
have many more points of coherence because we only have to focus on one coherent topic at a time. And that topic is a topic of harmonious practice and harmonious spiritual living. OK? Next. So here's, again, what it looks like. So in January, and in a minute, you're going to see what these, well, you have them in front of you. So I'm, I'm going to show them on the screen. So if everyone is harmoniously focusing on help others in January, on you count in February, and by the way, each month has a color. As I pointed out, um, the spikers are wearing award gold, which is the color of the month. I would have been wearing award gold if I didn't want to wear Leo's jacket. Um, but this makes it possible because it, to give coherence one month at a time, and because the, what we're coherently meditating on and practicing and bringing into us is a harmonious practice, and a, a harmonious thought, then altogether it comes together in one consciousness. And it's using the theory of harmonic balance interchanges. Okay? Look a little like something we all know and recognize? Of course. Applying the Russ Russellian framework of ordered cosmogony to expanding worldwide compassion from human relations to humane relations. Science is complex only in her repetitive effect. Key, key, repetitive effect. Right now, a lot, when I give talks, and when I train teachers in schools and things, I tell them, you know, the negative in the world is overwhelming, but the good is so fragmented that nothing can get any traction. You know, you hear a good story here, a good story there. Your heart is warmed. But it's fleeting because it doesn't, there's not enough focus for enough time for us humans to bring it in and, and make it a sustainable shift in our behaviors and in our thoughts. Okay? Uh, this is my heart work, too. It doesn't look at all like Robert's, but so here's, here's the deal. Okay? So here is the unified field of one conscious. Maybe you wouldn't put it in the middle, but it kind of works so I can explain this. So like here is the field of one consciousness right here in the middle. And there are the, there are the, the avatars that we all know of. And of course, we could put Walter and Leo in there also. You know, Muhammad, the prophets, Jesus, whatever. And then out beyond that, those who have a highly concentrated sense of the field, there's the rest of us that are working with misperceptions of truth, and that moves outward. So we go down here, and we meditate. So when we meditate, we clear our mind of the garbage. My meditation teacher called, called it backing in the garbage truck. You know, we, we clear our mind, and we open up the space so that the, so that the, the unified field and the field of consciousness has a chance to break through and reach us. That's what happens when we meditate. Up here, I'm showing that as the practice and the, and the meditation on these 12 aspects of harmonious living are practiced, and as the practice of those and the conscious awareness of those on a month-by-month -month basis grows, they will draw us in to the unified field. OK? Next. So this is a slide written. Actually, I would show any, any, any room full of teachers who I was training to do the 12 Habits program in their schools. This is showing you know, the habits going around in a year, human relations, media, and marketing campaign. Each month has a spiritual and a practice component. Okay, we're going to run through these next 12 quickly because everyone actually sort of has them. So this is, and are all your, so, so, it, so from now on, tomorrow morning in your meditation, focus on doing your best. In September, I practice my habit to do my best. So it, there's, a, there's a spiritual component and there is a physical component. Launch into a do your best attitude and stay with it. But they're coordinated. So you can leave this room with that book. And not only, you'll see there's a half a page reading for each day. They're 
like next, or not next month, but November is positive attitude. So like in November, every, every, every day I tell a few jokes. I mean, how better to get somebody in a positive attitude than tell a, do jo tell a few jokes? So I'm, I I'm asking everyone in this room, from this moment on, start this cycle with me. You're going to leave this room with all you need to do it. October is be patient and listen. I pause for my habit. That's the meditation. To be patient and listen. November, positive attitude. You saw those. Those are teenagers from Warm Springs Middle School in Berkeley Springs. They were sixth to eighth graders. And one of the things you didn't see is that they were part of the Kids Talk team, learning these 12 habits. And um, also, they were all around the room, manning the cameras. So not only were they, you know, were they learning the good character, but they were also learning the mechanical skills of videoing and, you know, how to, how to do the productions as well. Okay, December, celebrate community and family and friends. You know, what is, what is December? Except when the supply train got all backed up in December, I said to myself, good, let's give each other our time and our love and one another. We don't need the stuff. You know, it's about getting along together. That's what December is all about, celebrating ourselves and one another. Next one, January. The reason, help others. The reason is help others is because in, at the end of December, all that giving of the holiday season drops in the toilet. Do you know that January is the highest, the highest rate of suicide of any month of the year? So, and, and I'll, it's too much to tell you the story of the people in summer. Actually, this was crowdsourced. I had the idea of the months and the habits, but a group of 12 people of a small town called Somerset, Pennsylvania, spent nine months figuring out which month was which and what the habits would be. So they all worked together. Kids, the mayor, the owner of a local radio station, the head of the ministerial association, I mean, all figured this out together. So they said, let's make January help others to keep that giving spirit going from, from December. February, Valentine's Day, also, um, it's the one month holiday that's gotten some traction, Black History Month. What is Black History Month about? You count. So why not extend that uplifting feeling of you count and, and, and include ourselves in the thought meant by that in, in February, and we all count. Everyone has getting back into his numbers. I, couldn't, I didn't know the seconds, but I know the, I know the minutes. I do an exercise with kids in a classroom where kids who don't think these are mediated kids who don't think they're worth anything. So I go around and I have each of the kids tell me how many people they've interacted with in that day. And they'll say, you know, three, five, six, however many from the time they woke up. And I'll show them that if I did that in this room right now, it's only, let's see, it's right now, it is 1119. I could prove to you that in this room, we've probably already interacted with more than between 1,000 and 2,000 people. We are all powerful. Let's go to the next one. March is resolve conflicts in like a lion, out like a lamb. I'm going to go through them quickly. OK? Take care of our environment. We need more than Earth Day. We need to be focusing on it for the whole month. And the April afterwards, and the April after that, and the April after that for the whole month. Because this is a spiral that will keep going that we're going to start right here in this room. OK? In May, actually the group, the biggest problem they had was whether November should be grateful because of Thanksgiving or May should be grateful. But they finally decided that being grateful is a positive attitude. And there's so much in May that's being grateful, you know, Memorial Day, Mother's Day, whatever, that they may, may be grateful. OK, next. June, reach higher. Get out of a rut. Improve yourself. OK? J July, the month of our patriots, the 4th of July. Become involved like they did. OK? August, sit back and reflect. Know who you are. I mean, ask yourself, do you really spend the minutes of your day in, in sync with what matters to you? 
Okay? So here they all are. We've been through them, and you have them all to take with you. And the thing is, in 30 years, not once has anybody ever come up to me and said they didn't agree with any of these 12 golden habit rules because they lift us up above the division. And at least for some moment of time, I call it, I call it, you know, but there's mental health, I call it mental nutrition. We, we know about physical nutrition, but we need mental nutrition as well, okay? So, knowledge and awareness is relatively easy compared to practice. This is a huge challenge. The people who love Walter and Rayo, Leo, the people who love their works, we're thinkers. We love the knowledge. We love the beauty. So I'm challenging you. I'm asking you just for a minute a day, start following this pattern and help the Age of Character Clubs go forward into the future with just a minute of your day following this pattern. And like the, like the uh, Transcendental Meditators, like prayer, we can start sending it out into the universe. Uh, share it on your uh, social media, whatever you want. But the influence, so here's the, here's the way things are at the moment in a community. There are barriers. So here's a community. In every community, the schools, the churches, the government, the businesses, they're all doing their own thing. They don't have anything in common to speak of. They all have their own culture going on. But that's not actually true. There are a few things that no matter where you go in a community, you are going to find they're all doing it. And here's what they are. Right? They're all going to be doing Mother's Day. They're all going to be doing the, celebrating the 4th of July. They're all going to be doing Valentine's Day and Thanksgiving. Because they, they know when to expect what. They, it's predictable. It's organized. They, so in any part of a community, nothing may be the same in all of those environments. Except on those days, you'll find they all come together. And that's my hope and my dream for the 12 habits. That will all be coming together that way. Okay, so this is what it looks like. This is, it looks a little complicated. Maybe you can't. So right to the on the left is a normal community, and what we're really talking about with the twelve habits is changing the climate of a community. So normally in a community, the climate of attitudes and behaviors of the people kind of just circles around everything, and in that climate, there is drugs and alcohol and all the things that going going on. Over here, and I'm going to show you the statistical proof that what this is true. When the climate is resonating these, these 12 aspects, these golden habits of unity, there's a compressive effect. And there's reduced human suffering and monetary costs. Do these things go away? No. Will they be compressed? Yes. Can we use the money that we don't spend on this stuff? And, and promote the 12 habits? Yes, we can. OK, next. So here is, you can't see the lines going out into the dark. But so we have, I call it the phenomenon of us and them. So right now, we're very much out at the very far end here. Um, us and them, and, se and, and separatism is driving us and them further and further apart. We had a period of appreciation of diversity where at least we were trying to appreciate how we were different and we were trying to come together. What I'm showing you is that when people focus on 12 aspects of universal harmonious living, these rise above and there is no them in any of these things. And that's what the evolution of humane relations looks like. Okay. So in 1993, after the research I'm going to show you in a minute, this model was named a social invention by the London Institute. In, 19, in 2007, I was invited by International Rotary. And this sign here is from the Rotarians. And I spent three weeks in Rwanda teaching every headmaster in Rwanda who wanted their young people to grow up never, ever 
to never have a genocide in Rwanda again. Their national motto was never again. And they chose this model to teach their young people to grow up to want to be in harmony and never have a fight like that again, okay? This is the slide I've been waiting to get to. So this was the University of Pennsylvania at Indiana did a study in, in Somerset, Pennsylvania. This has been in two or 300 communities, but getting the research done is not that easy. So in three communities, we've actually done research, and the data has been very, very similar to this data from the one. So when you, have, when you do years apart, the same research in different communities, and they all come up pretty much alike, that's very validating. So in Somerset, after just two years of practice in that community where they were surrounded with the habits. It was on the radio, television, they did it in the schools. 39% of the population said they actually were motivated to improve their behaviors. 72% said they felt more cared about and connected to others in the communities. These were actual community surveys done, collected, and tabulated by a university. And, and also, for the first time in 12 years, the criminal court dockets went down 10%, which saved the county $160,000, okay? If this isn't awareness of love and light in action among the population that needs to get it, I don't know what is. But this is what the awareness of love and light out there in the world looks like, okay? This is the study that was done in the city of Pittsburgh by the um, University of Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public Health, Dr. Ritchie. This, this, they, they, they surveyed 14,000 kids in the schools in and around Pittsburgh. Honor rolls went up, de detentions decreased, 85% of the kids reported more caring, respectful behaviors. Actually, I had so many surveys in my trunk one time that the rear of my car was like bouncing on the ground. But of all those surveys, one kid said, I am now nice to the people I used to be mean to. That's my favorite. What else is there? What else is there? There's one other. They, when the, you saw some of our awards, the, uh, the uh, Pittsburgh uh, Health Department, we were awarded the Violence Free Youth Award for the program that we did in one of the worst schools in the city of Pittsburgh. And so they were interviewing kids in an alternate school where adjudicated kids are. And so this person from the health department was asking him, well, how did the 12 habits affect you? And this one big kid got up from the back and he said, until now, nobody ever told me how you're supposed to be. No one had told him that you're supposed to be grateful, that you're supposed to be patient, that you're supposed to help others. No one had told him, and now he knew. So this is, again, that's why I repeat this slide. This is right out of the Iliad. Yeah, it, it, it's in there on twice on purpose. Um, Recognition of spiritual demand sufficient to enforce its practice, and I've just shown you the proof that this really works, is the evidence of the beginning of man's unfolding to his cosmic stage. And this is what I am hoping and dreaming is going to come about as we move forth and look at a new way of sharing the age of character as Leo so deeply desired with the rest of the world. So the 12 golden values shared in magnitude sufficiently and sustainably to enforce their practice will awaken global love and light. And there's my silly little thing that I drew, okay? <laughs> so this is kind of a diagram. You can't see it really well. So, so this is showing how the message expands in a community. And you're actually holding a, a flyer that's a, one of the main components that's used in communities. These are in all the stores and gas stations and, you know, and, and they, on the first of the month, the old ones are collected and the ones for the next month go up. So there's one of these for every month of the year. 
So here are the habits up here at the top. Then this shows how they are socialized into statewide media and local schools and communities. In, one school, one, in a lot of uh, communities with radio stations, you know, the kids will go, will, will, in English class, they'll write a 30 second spot and then they'll be invited down to the radio station. Well, you saw the kids at the beginning talking about the habit, be positive. So they'll go down to the radio station and be on air so all their parents and friends get to hear them on air. What are they, what are they on the radio about? Asking the rest of their community to behave in one of these manners, okay? Then down here, these are some of the, these are some of the elements. I said you've got a flyer, so radio, banners. This is the banner. There's actually a banner this size that goes up each month in, in schools. Uh, they're involved in this. And so in their lunchrooms is often where they put it. So the kids walk you into lunch, and the first thing they see is the banner that says, be patient and listen, or do your best, or whatever the habit is. So these are all the elements of, not all, I mean, there's lots that people can think of. There are bracelets, there are poster sets, idea books, literacy, on and on, okay? So this is how it looks at a community. Next. This is a board just showing how you know, you have one flyer, September's flyer, but you see on this board, you know, there's a whole stack of them. Uh, there's bookmarks, there's table tents. So restaurants have them on their, on their tables. There's pencils. The pencils don't say University of Science and Philosophy. The pencils don't say Elaine Park. The pencils say, do your best. <laughs> so that's the message. Go ahead. This, now I'm gonna just show you. This is gonna give you the, the rest of the, my presentation is just some slides and insights. I mean, these are kids in, I, f I forget which school this was. This might have been still in Berkeley Springs. So kids are, um, do your best, wear a ward gold. These are the kids, some of the kids assembled together with the principal. Next. Uh, oh, I know the upper left is October, be patient and listen. See all the, uh, see all the purple in the crowd, kids all wearing purple. This was, this cake was baked at a senior center where they were having trouble with, with bickering. The older people were bickering. <laughs> so, so when March came around, what did they do? They baked a get along together cake and helped end the bickering in the senior center. Uh, this down here is a local coffee shop, um, Betty Lou. Uh, every place that supports the program gets a little sign. See this little sign here? It says, this is a wonderful people place. This can be called anything. It's been called the Caring Habits Month Adventure. It's been called, you know, the 12 Habits of Unity. It's been called the 12 Golden Habits. I tell people, you can call this Fred if you want to. Just do your best in September. Be patient in October. You know, just do the things in order. Name it what you want. I don't care. Uh, a lot of schools will, will think, pick a theme. Um, one school, their, their motto was a wolf, so they called themselves wild and wonderful wolves. So it doesn't matter what you call it, as long as you stick to the system and the protocol. These are two policemen, and there's a napkin holder on a table in a little restaurant in the town that says, and you know because it's gold, what does it say? Exactly. See how easy this is. I mean, Robert kept saying, Everything was easy yesterday, and I kept thinking, no, Robert, everything looks really hard to me, but <laughs> this really is easy. <laughs> this, is a li this is a library. So the librarians, they put the table tents up on all the library tables. They post the signs around. Obviously, the libraries give out bookmarks. It just, it's time to show a positive attitude and smile at the library, okay? Uh, this shows that the habits can be also used for health. In September, um, uh, do your best is also the health focus is nutrition. Because when you eat right, you, you know, when you eat right, you're, you do better in school, you do better at work. So every month is also tied to a health focus, which is way too complicated to get into today. But it is part of the program. These are kids in a parade carrying signs down the street. And what do those signs say? You count. Take care of our environment. 
they're all there. Kids are walking down the main street of their town carrying those signs. This is one of those banners I was talking about that looks a lot like this, that gets put up. So the first of each month is 12 Habit Day, and that's when all the, everything from the old month goes down and everything from the new month goes up. This was, the, I'd never forget this. I had just walked into one of the schools and one of the teachers, it was October, and she rushed up to show me. She'd painted her, painted her fingernails. The color for October is slow down lavender. So she had painted her, her. <laughs> one of the things that's important to tell you about this is that, like for instance, that particular school, they had assemblies every single month. I was in and out of school all the time. I did train the teachers. But by the end of the year, even though I had been in the school so often, you can't imagine, no one in the school knew who I was. Because I have never been the star of this show. The 12 habits are the star of this show. In marketing and advertising, I mean, nobody knows who wrote, I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony for Coca-Cola. Because the guy that wrote that was an ad guy. You know, he wasn't going to have a concert with millions of people in adulation of who he was and whatever. You know, he was just an ad guy that wrote a jingle for Coca-Cola. So I'm just this person. But this is the star of my show. I'm not the star. Okay. This is the municipal center in the town of Bath. You can barely see one of the monthly signs right inside the front door. These are some of the workers at the, it was, oh, uh, June is interesting. 20 years ago when I wrote that book, June was jump out of a rut. And a few years later, we had a, we had a, a forum of teenagers kind of going over the 12 habits. And one of the kids said to me, one of the teenagers says, what's get out of a rut? Well, get out of a rut is an idiom that goes back to horse and buggy days. It meant, you know, to us then, it meant improve yourself, you know, reach higher, whatever. But to these teenagers, like it was, Ugh. They didn't understand what it was at all. So even though the general principle of each of the months has never been questioned, never been changed in, in nearly 30 years, it, we've modified it just a little bit. So that's why June went from jump out of a rut to reach higher. OK, one more. So this is just stacks of materials getting ready to be handed out. Uh, I don't know where, this, I think this was the media department at a library. There's Logan. Uh, this, this is a couple that run a, you know, a wildlife education program and they're authorized by the government to have wild animals. They have 12 acres so that they're very you know, friendly to the animals and they bring them into the schools. And so that, that is Logan. That's the picture that you, that's the wolf that you see being pictured with in the program. And he was in that school for resolve conflicts, OK? This is the sheriff's office. So all the probation officers get bookmarks and little handouts and pencils for the kids. So when the kids on probation come in to meet with their probation officer, they don't only you know, talk about their problem. They also get given a pencil and a bookmark and something pos and they discuss the habit of the month and they give the kid something positive they can do, okay? So, what could be next? Oh, since 2007, uh, Caring Habits Rwanda, this is the logo that's used in Rwanda. Caring Habits was one of the former names of it. Caring Habits Rwanda is another former name of it. Has been functioning in many schools in Rwanda through the generosity of Rotary, and this is the banner that was created. The interesting thing in Rwanda is, and a, a lot has happened in Rwanda in the 10 years since I've been there, but their schools had so little that in order to make the monthly colors, the schools were sent buckets of the primary colors of paint, and then a chart showing how much to mix of each color in order to make the habit colors. And then they would paint th the habit around the school. I mean, that's how they had to do it in Rwanda, where they didn't even have printing. And many of the billboards around the country were, were just plywood with something painted on them. Anyway, that was probably one of the most thrilling experiences of my life, to spend three weeks in non, 
Americanized Rwanda among these people. This is the classroom where I, these are some of the teachers I was working with, okay? Next. So now, Brazilian cosmogony, I'm glad I told you I had myasthenia gravis, <laughs> is alive and at work in science, philosophy, and in human relations. What is it? Humane, humane relations. Yes, you guys got it. Okay. This is just one of, God, if there's a thousand articles, yes. Okay, we're just, we're just about there. This is just one of jillions of articles written about the program over the, over the 30 years. I'd say between 1,000 and 2,000 articles. I've also wrote, written, juried articles, as Robert was talking about, in magazines, primarily educational magazines. But this was the story about how um, in January of that particular year, every child, all 2,000 kids in the whole school system, wrote a thank you note to all the businesses and organizations in the community who were helping with the habits. And they were all put in envelopes and delivered to the, uh, and delivered to the merchants, showing that the kids appreciated what they were doing for them in the community. And that's what this article is about, okay? So, yes, I have a 125-page book. <laughs> Thank you. There's a 125-page idea book that teachers can draw from with activities, vocabulary, all coordinated with the monthly habit. But it's called an idea book. They don't have to do it. Because if one teacher does it um, at one point in one classroom and the kids pass to another classroom, you know, the kids are going to be surrounded. So it's not imperative. So the teachers loved this, the t doing the 12 habits, because it, they didn't have to learn a lot of curriculum. Yes? How do you pick the schools that are going to get this? Well, of course, eventually they picked us. Um, this was huge in Pittsburgh. And we were about a half a million dollar a year operating system nonprofit, um, operating in a, a couple of hundred communities, um, about half that many schools. It was just growing and growing and growing. We had. We had grants from the Heinz Foundation, the Carnegie Foundation, all these big foundations. And then the recession hit, and the stock market went from almost 1,200 down to 7,000. And if any of you know much about foundations, um, we were a nonprofit. The name of the nonprofit is All of Us. Uh, the website, if you want to go to the website, it's 12, the number 12, habits for all of us org. And if, on that website, under how to share, you can actually load down next month's flyer. You know, you can load down anything you want and print it off. So um, then the, the, so the teachers basically managed it from that point on. Because this is involving media and visually, it's like wrapping the kids in arms of love. It's so easy to do. And then the University of Pittsburgh got involved and they did surveys and studies. So they, it, it was a combination of statistically taking you know, pre-programmed data from on grades and whatever before the program started, statistical data combined with surveys they did to the kids. You know, what happens mean to you? How did you change? So forth. And those are the answers that are compiled in that information. And it, yes? Uh, a couple of facts and a question. Um, anybody heard the musician Nako Bear? Who? Nako Bear, Medicine for the People. He has a song about the wolves, which wolf will you feed? It's quite beautiful. And I just recommend I'd it to I'd love anybody. to meet him. Uh, he, yeah, he would, he would love this stuff. Medicine for the People would come perform and do stuff. Do Nako's you know song. him? Um, I know the community. He's very accessible, amazing guy. N-A-H-K-O, -A Nako Bear. Um, wondered if you've run into Search Institute Yes, of course. Uh, and then, do you know Community Matters? Yes. So I'm part of Safe School Ambassadors. Since yes. it was founded, I was part of the founding of that program. And right. if people don't know, we've actually trained Safe School Ambassadors in over 2% of the public schools in the United States. And uh, how many of you have heard of the reconciliation movement in schools? 
where no longer are kids expelled and sent into prisons, the families and the perpetrators in violence come together and they're taught reconciliation. And uh, Community Matters just got the contract from the federal government and the Secret Service and all these insurance companies. And they're developing the reconciliation curriculums for the nation. And I just feel like uh, I should introduce you to our folks in Santa Rosa because I I'm going to Santa Rosa, the end of October, I'll be there. Well, come visit us and we'll go over to Community Matters. I'll introduce you to Rick Phillips. One of the things that I'll, I'll tell the group, here's the interesting thing. Uh, there's a piece that I wrote for uh, schools, psychology in schools, around the time of the Littleton study. And that's when, right after the Littleton, pro, you know, the Littleton shootings, Columbine. they, they be, Columbine, they began what, a thing called blueprints, where they, where they, developed a methodology for evaluating school programs, whether they worked or not. The problem is they adopted the medical control model uh, approach to evaluating how programs in schools work. A control methodology to validating a program requires a control group that is not infected with the program to be over here and the people infected with, you know, the people who are infected with the program are over here and you have to be able to show that there is a change in the population that has the program versus the control group. A program like this, which is entirely media, it's impossible to have a control group. So even though I know the guy that started, name starts with a B, the guy that started the blueprints out in out in Littleton or out in Colorado. This program was never approved by that methodology because it simply is impossible for this approach to be measured in medical methodology terms. Hello everybody, this is John Bonsell, President, University of Science and Philosophy. I want to thank you for participating in our wonderful 2022 homecoming, moving into the future, living a life triumphant. So if you would like to reach out to us, we would love for you to visit our website at philosophy.org and anything that you could do to help us promote this message throughout the world would be greatly appreciated. And thank you.